In chapter four, they have resurrected several monuments to help be remembrance to the children of Israel of crossing over, not the Red Sea, but the Jordan. And I find it very interesting in Joshua. Joshua, to, to me, would be a great movie if you just left it, Joshua, and it's brutal and it's chaotic as it can be. But there's some great spiritual meanings in Joshua. Some, some meanings that when you grab a hold of and you look at it holistically, as the whole chapter, you see that Joshua was, was a man that, that, that had an awesome uphill task in front of him. But that uphill task that he had in front of him, if he just walked the steps and obeyed God, he was already going to win. And being a part of a, a, a culture, a people that know that their victory is assured at the end is a blessing all in itself. I think chapter 5 is a transitional phase where it starts to talk about how they traveled over to Canaan and how they got close to where they had to start doing battle where they were actually called the men of war. And at the end of chapter 5, we have a very cliffhanger, right? Anybody like cliffhangers? I love cliffhangers in series, but I don't like when the series takes a long time to come. I don't like when in season 1, at the end of season 1, there's a cliffhanger and then I have to wait for season two. But God doesn't do that here. God does it at the end of chapter five. Lozen and I was talking about it. It's kind of like a, ooh, this is about to get good moment, right? And then immediately it goes into chapter six. So whoever doing chapter six, it's going to be good. But in chapter five, it begins with talking about the fear of many kings. Then it talks about starting a second generation and then the cliffhanger, then the mighty uh, commander of the Lord's army shows up. So let us pray before we get into God's word. Our Father, we truly thank you for this time that we can sit in and be attentive to your word. Father, let the words of my mouth be the uh, ideas that you would have me to give out, Lord God. Father, I am nothing more than a mere man that is flawed that is trying to relay to your people your perfect word. Father, as we grab a hold and grab the understanding of your perfect word, help us to be spiritual in the understanding of it. And Father, we thank you for this time again, that we may become better children unto you. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. So if we look at Joshua chapter 5, starting at verse 1. It says, So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings that, uh, of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their hearts melted. Note that. And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. And if we stop right there, that is a long first sentence. That sentence has commas and semicolons and all these other, you know, English abbreviations to bring out this really great point that the kings are messed up. The kings, of, you know, if the kings are sitting there on their thrones and they haven't seen exactly what was going on. They didn't actually see. They didn't look out the window and see what was happening. The Bible says they heard it. That means somebody had ran all the way back and says they did it again. Because if you look back in Joshua chapter, uh, I think it was Joshua chapter 2. And you look in Joshua chapter 2, starting around verse 10. It says that, that Joshua brought up the time where the children of Israel had, 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 where, where God had dried up the Red Sea and they went over into Egypt and they came away from Egypt and the, and the people and the kings of the Amorites, they were on the other side of the Jordan and what happened? He destroyed the children of Israel, destroyed all the nations that were over there. Here it is again that the, that, that the Amorites and the kings of the Canaanites are looking at a situation where how in the world did all of these thousands of folks, if you could paint this in your mind, I got a great imagination, right? So I'm seeing the Ark of the Covenant. 
And the Ark of the Covenant is about 1,000 or 1,000 feet away from the multitude. And you just see a thousand people walking a thousand feet from the Ark of the Covenant, and they touch the water. The Bible says, and certain scholars, and depending on what history books you're reading, it says about eight miles was dried up. Eight miles dried up. Can you imagine being a, a seaman, being, being in the shore, and then all of a sudden your boat hits the bottom and it's all dried up? The, God stopped the water about eight miles from where the children of Israel were crossing. That is a feat that the, that the kings had to notice. And kings have armies, right? Can you imagine, what, what would we be scared of just a bunch of people crossing over to Mexico? Crossing over, we wouldn't be scared of that. But if the water's dried up and they crossed over, then somebody's going to take notice. Somebody's going to take notice when a thousands and thousands of people are following. And, and, and we already know this has happened before. See, if you're a king... You got some great history. Almost 40 years ago, this same thing has happened. This time, Joshua and his people and the people of God are traveling, and the water stops for about eight miles. And the kings of the Amorites and the kings of the Canaanites can't help but they're going to be destroyed. They can't help but to think that this is going to be a problem for them immediately, and it says their hearts melted. When, it, when you look at the text and what it means their heart melted, it means all their carriage had went away. All their desire to fight, all that. If a king loses his heart, how's he going to lead the army? If a king loses his ability to lead the army, the army will surely want to do, run away the other way. But he says there was no spirit in them to fight anymore. I, I, I like to watch a, some, some UFC sometimes, some MMA sometimes, and you can see when somebody don't want to fight no more. You can see when they had enough and they're ready to go away. There is no winning when it comes to fighting against God. I kind of go back when David says that he will, he will make your enemies his footstool, our footstool. Do you know what that means? Anybody have a footstool at home? We use it all the time because just because I can't reach that when Rona brings out the footstool, she steps it up all the time. I sometimes have to use that step up too. And when your enemy is your footstool, that means they are nothing to you. They are nothing to you, and God has made it that way, but there's something that has to happen first. You have to be obedient to God. And as soon as God blessed the children of Israel, verse 2, he says, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself, and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskin. Now, the funny thing about this one, the interesting things, maybe not so funny, is God is the same today as he was yesterday and the day before. We say it a lot of times, but if you look in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 27, the flint knife was a flint stone that had to be sharpened down. Because in the law, it says that no Israelite, you cannot do this procedure. You cannot do this spiritual procedure with a man-made knife. You had to use something that God considered as purity. You had to use a blade from the knife. So if you could imagine that Joshua is sitting there and he's making these flint knives. And he's making these flint knives because he has to be according to what God has issued a way back before his, <clears throat> before he ever walked the earth. And he says, all the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, all the men of war did, uh, had died in the wilderness on the way. After that, they came out of Egypt. All the people who came out have been circumcised. But all the people who were born in the wilderness on the way they had came out, they had not been circumcised. To all the people who were men of war, who came out of Egypt, excuse me, were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Joshua was filled with a time where he had to perform a spiritual act to do to God's people because God had a plan for those people. 
I remind you of a time where if we want to partake in some spiritual things, we have to perform some spiritual acts. Before we can perform, before we can engage in spiritual things, we must first become spiritual. And if for order for us to become spiritual, we have to do some spiritual things that was laid out thousands of years ago. And he says, to whom the Lord sworn that he would not show the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he had given them, a land flowing of milk and honey. And Joshua circumcised their sons whom he had raised up in their place, that they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished being circumcised or when he finished circumcising all the people, they stayed in their camps until they healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of this place is Gilgal to this day. God has set forth and he has laid out a perfect plan for his people. And the Bible says because they didn't listen, they had to walk it out for 40 years. Walking out, out of the promise. They walked out of the promise because they did not listen to the God that gave them the words. If you can imagine, that could be us. That could be us if God gave us a promise. And he laid it out in his word. And we become a disobedient. We may look at them and say, how could they not? Listen to God. How could they not? He, he, had, he had the fire by day and the pillar of smoke by night, or fire by night and smoke by day. And he had all of these things, all of these signs, and all of these. He parted the Red Sea. They went on in dry land. They had manna. How can they walk away from God? How can they not obey God? But the proof is in the Word. The proof is in the Word showing that they did. They, they, Joshua sent out spies, just like Moses sent out spies. But when Joshua sent out spies, those spies came back with good news. When Moses sent out spies, those spies came back what? Well, I don't know. I don't know yet. Yeah, we know God said that we could do it, but I don't know. Any type of doubt. They had doubt all in their mind. So God allowed for them to be lost and consumed in the wilderness. I find it interesting that the word caused these men, these, the males that came out of Egypt, he calls them men of war. And I was like, man, what? But these are just children of God. And when you look at it, when it, it caused my mind to think about my army days. When you, when, you, when you sit down in front of the liaison and you say, okay, what do you want to do? And I say, well, I wanted to be in computers because I did not want to go fight. And you can't fight a computer. Like if you're in the back with a computer, the computer needs air conditioning. I did not think I would be in the desert. But you know what they told me? Your primary job in the army is what? Infantry. This is what this, is what this walk is. Our primary job, whatever we do in the ministry, in the body, that's secondary. Our primary job is to do what? Fight. We're fighting against our uh, spiritual Principalities, we're, we're, Keaton talked about it early. We're fighting against the whole world, wants it all. the whole American world wants to focus on two parties. And they want to sway you from one end to the other way. They want you to, you better pick the right one, and if you don't pick the right one, I don't want to be your friend anymore. We are the outliers. We are the ones that are different. The whole world wants us to do one way. They want us to look this way, but we are fighting daily. We're fighting the old man, our old selves, our natural selves. We are fighting the way society tells us to look. We are always fighting. We're always combating. Our first job in the army of the Lord is infantry. We may have our individual ministries that we, are, that we work with one another on, but our first job is infantry in the battle of the Lord. So 
So God, because of their disobedience, says, listen, you will not see this land of milk and honey that's flowing with milk and honey. God said that <clears throat> because of your disobedience, you're going to have to walk it out for 40 years. But all the while, God's enemies are still his enemies. All the while, while the kings sit in their high places, God is preparing and taking care of his people. God has took care of his people from the time they left Egypt till the time of such, uh, of such spiritual increase of his people. How do we know? Let's look at verse 10. Verse 10, he says, Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal. Once again, they're healing from the spiritual change that they have to go through. A lot of people will say, well, it's just circumcision. No, this is a spiritual order from God. The spiritual command that God gave his people that says, listen, you, in order to be in my covenant, in order to obey to Genesis chapter 17, verse 10, in order for you to be a part of my people, you must be circumcised. This is a covenant God said to Moses, <coughs> excuse me, to Abram. He said, this is a covenant between me and you, that you, your household, and your descendants must be a part. You must be circumcised. And it says, verse 10, now the children of Israel camped in Gilgah and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month of the twinkle of the twilight, excuse me, on the plains of Jericho. Imagine if you lived in Jericho. The pictures and the sides of Jericho is enormous. And you look out your doors, and as you come in and out of Jericho, you see a multitude of people. You see tents. You see camp. If you've seen the movies where the, the armies are coming and they're camping around their enemy and you've got tents all over the place, that is a force. But they are not thinking about fighting at this time. God is preparing his people to be spiritual. God is preparing his people to be righteous. And for the first time in a very long time, they're able to keep the Passover. They were able to sit down and keep the Passover. The Passover was a, a sign or a, a traditional feast for the Israel to celebrate the Passover in Egypt. We all know the stories that God sent his angel and he passed over the house as long as they had the blood over their ark. As long as they had the blood over the door, God's angel of death passed over their house. And subsequently, they were able to escape Egypt, if you look in Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 28. But since that time, God's people did not keep the Passover. You could not keep the Passover if you were not circumcised. You could not partake in spiritual things if you were not spiritual. We have thousands, if not millions, if I'm pretty sure it's millions, that grab a hold of this word, grab a hold of those Bibles in your hand and say, I understand the word. They grab a hold of those Bibles and they will depict the Bible and they will tear the Bible apart and they say they understand the word, but they're not spiritual. How can non-spiritual people understand something spiritual? This is why we, when we evangelize, this is why we talk, when, this, when we have conversations with individuals, it turns into a mm, little bit of a debate because they have their ideology. They have the, their way. Grandma always told me. I lived in grandma always told me for 17 years. My daddy always said, no, what did the Bible say? So spiritual people, cannot partake, uh, uh, excuse me, non-spiritual people cannot partake in spiritual things. Verse 11, and they ate the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain or roasted grain <clears throat> on the very same day. Then the manna, look at this. Did anybody else think that manna stopped when they were walking in the wilderness? I did. 
I thought manna was long gone. I didn't know what they were eating, but I just thought that manna was an was a Egypt traveling type of thing. Right? I didn't even understand. I didn't even realize that manna was still coming down. He says, listen, then the manna ceased on the day after they ate or eaten the produce of the land. Then the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Is not God good? Look how God took care of his people, even though they weren't spiritual, even though they were disobedient. Those 40 years where they were walking it out because they did not want to believe or they did not want to obey God, God still took care of his people. Look at our lives. I'm going to look at my life. There were some times where I was not being obedient to God. There were some times where I was not following God's word, and he still allowed a remnant. He still allowed me some time to come back to him. He still had a plan for my life. If you look back at your life, you may see the same thing. Hopefully you see the same thing, that all good things come to those who are called by uh, his name and are called into his purpose. So that manna that was taking his children as they crossed the Jordan, that were taking his children as they crossed oh, going towards Canaan from Egypt, the, that manna that sustained his children for well over 40 years, God still was providing it still. This bread from Yahweh provided sustenance for the children of Israel and from Exodus chapter 16 all the way to now, where God blessed the soil in Canaan to where they were able to produce their own food. That land of, that was flowing from milk and honey is coming true. That land that was flowing from, for, <clears throat> of milk and honey that their, that their ancestors couldn't see, that their fathers couldn't see because of their disobedience, now they're able to see it. Because there's some things they did. They were obedient. They followed the ark into the, the, the overflowing Jordan. When God stopped the waters, they crossed through. They were obedient. When God came to Joshua and said, you have to circumcise all the people there, all the men of war, he was obedient. The people were obedient when it was time to be circumcised. And at this time, verse 9, he says, God told Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. This day I looked at everything that you did from the time you got close to Egypt to the time you were in Egypt to the time you left Egypt. I'm rolling it away. I'm putting it away. If you look at what the children of Israel did in Egypt, they started to serve other gods. They started to look at other gods. They started to get away from, 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 from God's way and started to adopt the ways of other people. If you look at Genesis chapter 34, it talks about a time where Jacob's daughter, Diana, was raped. And the brothers were so angry about that they can conspired against those who wanted to marry their daughter, marry their sister. And they told him, he told Shechem, he says, listen, if you circumcise yourself, because if you don't circumcise yourself, we can't let you marry our, daughter, our, our sister. Genesis chapter 34 says they circumcised themselves and all the men that were in their town, all the men that were in the kingdom, and why those men were healing. Jacob's sons went into the camp and killed all the men. Can you imagine that? You're already healing. You're, they're kicking you while you're down. So not only did they take something spiritual and use it against people that were not even spiritual, that were not even in the covenant, they used it for their own gain. Do we see people do that now? That we see people take what is supposed to be righteous and supposed to be spiritual and they use it for their own game? Sure we do. 
The children of Israel started doing all of these things, looking like the world. But at this time, now that they have circumcised themselves, now that they were obedient to God, now that they have had, had, had supplanted themselves just shy of the plains of Jericho, now that they have partaken of the Passover meal, now that they were completely obedient to God, God has says, listen, I'm going to take my manna and it's going to cease. You have plenty to do now and you have plenty of food to survive now, but there's a war to be done. There's some work to be done. Just because we step in the water and just because we get some understanding of the word and just because we come to Bible study every once in a while and just because we come here almost every Sunday, there's still work to be done. The battle is not in these walls, brothers and sisters. This battle is outside. How do we know? Because once they were in the plains of Jericho, the commander of the army of the Lord showed up. Let's look at verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by the Jericho and he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite of him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or our adversaries? You know, when I look at this, <laughs> I don't know if I would have been like Joshua. I don't know if I would have been sitting by Jericho and looking at the force in front of me and I see a man with a sword drawn, I'm going to walk up to him. I don't think that's going to be me. I probably would have been like the donkey that Balaam was riding on and went the other way. All right. I you see Joshua realizes that this is an opposing. This man is just not a regular man. Joshua walked to that man. Joshua came to that man. Well, maybe a little hesitant. We don't know. But the Bible says that Joshua walked to him in Acts. Are you for us? Why well, adversaries? I feel like this is like a, the Goodfellows thing, right? Well, you see the guy, you know, with the suit on, the black suit, and it's, a, it's the, the Italian movie, and it's like, hey, man, are you for me or are you for them? You know, one, one of those things. I feel like that's the situation that he's about to fall into when he says, so he said no. Well, no what? No to the first or no to the second? He says, no, neither. I'm not for you or the adversaries. Listen to what he says. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Joshua, in tune with the moment, he understands that he's in front of the, 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 the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is, he, he, can, he can take you out or he can raise you up. But then Joshua has to also understand that this battle has nothing to do, it's nothing personal, Joshua. It's nothing about you and it's everything about God. Our battles that we fight, spiritual battles that we fight, are about raising us up, but it's everything about God's glory. When we stand together and stand individual and we stand in the name of the Lord, remember, the world's going to hate you. Because they hated him. But the enemies are our footstool. Joshua realizes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, just command it and I'll do. And he says, then the commander of the Lord said to Joshua, take off your sandals. Take off your shoes. Off your feet for this place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Isn't it amazing, it's astonishing how fast God moves in this time. How fast God is moving for his people, for his children. He set them up. 
He got them holy. He, sanct he allowed them to be sanctified. He allowed to restore them. It is something to have a God where his mercy is so great and his love for us is so great that he gives us time to be restored. And when he restored them spiritually, he didn't let them start all the way over. Go all the way back to Egypt. Okay, go back to Egypt and start all over. Make sure you don't worship their gods. Make sure you don't fear. Make sure you don't doubt. No, he let them be where they were. He does that for us. When we fall down and we fall short and we make mistakes, he allows us to stand right up and be restored right then and there. Because he's ready to fight our battles. He's ready to fight our battles. I was talking to Isaiah the other day while we were, nope, nope, nope. It wasn't Isaiah, it was Grant. <laughs> I was talking to Grant and we were talking about what's it mean to be with God? What's it mean for God to, 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 to be the one in charge? What's it mean for the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Grant says, it means God got your back. God got your back, your front, your side, and everything else in between. All you have to do is be obedient. And the first thing that the, the, the commander of the Lord is going to do is take down one of the biggest opponents that they have. They are there in the plains of Jericho. Jericho, ancient Jericho, is just sitting there by the sea and by there, and it's just looking at those little tiny people. We got two walls. You can't get through two walls. You may get through one, but you're not going to get through two. They're not afraid. But the people of God had the commander. The people of God had the Lord on their side. And if you have went through and you have went through life and you have perceived that, that you can handle it all on your own. And you have lost your first initiative is to follow the way of the Lord. If you've lost that, then we invite you to come. If you have not yet became obedient to his righteousness, where you have the water sitting there. We don't have to circumcise anymore. Don't worry. We're not doing that no more. Just get in the water. Just believe he has come, conquered death, ascended, and sits on the right hand of God. The head, the neck of the church. If you believe that Jesus has come, if you believe that he is the son of the utmost and living God, you believe he died for your sins and rose on the third day, conquered death and holds the key to life in his hands. Please come as together we stand and sing the song of invitation.